Well, hi, how are you today? Now, many of you are aware that this past Friday, all over the world, people are remembering the 100th anniversary of the Turkish, Ottoman, Aut uh, Armenian uh, genocide that happened where uh, the, the, the Turks, they, they rounded up uh, a million and a half uh, Armenian Christians and they massacred the men, they took the, the women, the children, the elderly, and they put them on a death march out into the Syrian desert without food and water and uh, other atrocities that, that went with that. And, and of course, because of that, uh, there's all of these victims that survived that, and many of them experienced post-traumatic stress disorder, which we're, which we're talking about today. But it's not just people that go through an atrocity like the Holocaust or the Armenian Christian genocide that experience that. It's uh, people that experience all kinds of trauma in their life, maybe uh, some life-threatening illness or life-threatening situation thrown from an assault or a home invasion. Uh, and the most common types of, of uh, situations that often lead to uh, PTSD is through combat, through uh, uh, adult uh, violence and abuse, like spousal abuse and child abuse. Those are often the ones, things that lead to those kinds of things. Now, Time Magazine reported this past month that over a half a million troops who served in Afghanistan and in Iraq over the past 13 years have been diagnosed with PTSD, and yet even spending $3 billion a year, they're finding very little results that are coming from that. Now, on a graph that you can see, uh, there's no, not all things are equal. All traumas don't result in the same percentage of creating this illness, PTSD. And you can see the most common ones are is with combat, rape, and child abuse. Much higher likelihood of leading to PTSD. Now, PTSD has had different names throughout the years. During the American Civil War, it was referred to as soldier's heart. During World War I, it was shell shock. World War II is called battle fatigue. During the Korean War, it's called operation and exhaustion. And then only since the Vietnam War beyond has it been called post-traumatic stress disorder. There's other terms depending on the trauma though that, 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 uh, that PTSD occurs from, such as uh, rape trauma or battered wife syndrome or different names used for PTSD. Regardless of what it's called though, it has the same shared symptoms. But before we get into the symptoms, I wanna just kinda of have a working definition that we, that we uh, launch from. Here it is, PTSD is a mental, emotional, and spiritual suffering due to horrible past experiences resulting in a loss of faith that there is order and continuity in life. So one more time, PTSD is a mental, emotional, and spiritual suffering due to horrible past experiences resulting in loss of faith that there is order and continuity of life. In other words, that the trauma is so significant that it causes you to start to question uh, your, it, it rocks your soul mentally, emotionally, even at the spiritual level. And you question, where was God in this? And, and, and this whole idea that there's this bubble of protection starts to implode. And you wonder, is there any order? Is there any uh, stability in life? And if that doesn't get resolved, there's this fragility where you just walk through life and you're always on edge and it affects your dreams and it affects, and all these symptoms really are rooted out of that being unresolved. Bezel Dale uh, Kolk, the famous Dutch psychiatrist who is noted for his research in the area of post-traumatic stress said this, quote, the most corrosive impact of horrible emotional trauma is to be found in the spiritual fabric of persons. The condition of PTSD is spiritual at its deepest level. And the effects of PTSD are many, such as elevated levels of fear and anxiety, distressing memories and dreams about the traumatic event, and severe emotional distress, and physical reactions to something that reminds you of the event, just to name a few. And not only affects the person who has PTSD, but also kind of reverberates 
and to those around them, such as their families. For example, 40% of the kids that are raised by a parent with PTSD have academic failure, 30% chance of teenage pre pregnancy, 60% chance that there's going to be marital problems in that relationship with the person with PTSD. And then, of course, there's job loss is a very high percentage, not able to provide for the family. Now, while PTSD is m this more recent thing that is on the headlines and being funded and being discussed, like in the series that we have here with Unmasked Facing Mental Pain, it really goes back as far back as trauma has happened within human history, which is from the beginning. And so we can see this all throughout Scripture. Uh, and specifically, I want to pull out some biblical characters, two out of the Old Testament, one out of the New Testament, that experience these symptoms of PTSD. First of all is Job. Job. Job is the quintessential person to experience uh, trauma in his life. He's, 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 he's known the world around as the person who experienced trauma and had to battle through the experiences of that, that, that trauma brought on. Some of the things that happened to Job are is that he, he lost his material possessions. They were destroyed or stolen. His business was ruined. His employees were assassinated. A hurricane destabilizes his home, which collapses on his entire family. His children are all killed in this one event. And then on top of all of that, he, has, he comes down with this illness with painful sores all over his body. Now, that would make the most stable person mentally and emotionally uh, collapse and unwind. And that happened to Job. Job was very firm in his faith and yet and, in, and, in, and, and as an astute person, businessman and in his family. And yet here he is, the rest of the book of Job, he's processing his feelings, he's discussing it, he's experiencing these symptoms that are synonymous with what we know today as post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, let me just give you a few of the examples uh, I've listed there. Using the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders 5, DSM-5, which is the clinical book that psychiatrists and psychologists use to diagnose uh, people that have mental health issues, including uh, PTSD and those kinds of uh, illnesses. Uh, here's what Job, you see Job having some of these symptoms. Depression, anger, anxiety, loneliness, passive aggressive behavior, sleep disturbance, helpless feelings, and a persistent negative belief about himself. And so we see this, and I've listed some of those verses down there that you can look up on your own. I've just pulled out a few here. I'll read a couple. Job says, for example, why didn't I die at birth? My first breath out of the womb, my last. Why were there arms to rock me and breasts for me to drink from? I could be resting in peace right now, asleep forever, feeling no pain. That's Job 3. 11 through 13. Or when he says there in Job 7, 3, he says, Likewise, I've been given months that are of no use, and I've inherited nights filled with misery. And so clearly Job uh, faced these, these symptoms from the trauma that he endured that are, and, and, and as we look them and compare them against uh, the DSM-5, we see that those were, those were comparable to the symptoms that are, uh, that are congruent with D, with, uh, with PTSD. Another example in the Old Testament is King David. David. David had a number of traumatic events take place in his life, also in somewhat of a short period of time. Uh, he had s several near-death experiences. Uh, one was real famous when his uh, encounter with the giant Goliath, and uh, that was a near-death experience. Then he ends up going and working for an employer Saul, because of that, he becomes well-known, and, and then Saul gets angry at him, and when he's not looking, Saul throws a spear at him. So if you think you have a difficult time with your boss, hopefully he's not throwing a spear at you to kill you, but that's what happened to David. He has this spirit, near, he has a narrow, narrow mess. He runs for his life, has to leave his wife. He doesn't see her for years and years and years. And some of his friends that help him escape, they end up getting killed. He finds out about that. That devastates him. Then he's a fugitive running for his life, n a number of near-death experiences. Uh, one of those is, is an experience where his family, his kids are all uh, uh, kidnapped for several days, and they don't know if they'll ever get him. And, and his own men, because of uh, their kids were kidnapped as well, that they decide to turn on him, and they were going to kill him. 
and and that was a near death experience that he that he gets out of through some miraculous things that are that are that are uh, teased out in scripture. So here David has all of these traumas that happen in his life, and then we see through his writings, mostly through the Psalms that are mostly that are the majority of them are written by David. We see him talking about his emotions, about even his soul trouble, his spirit, how it bothered his spirit, some of these traumas that had happened to him. And uh, we see David experiencing symptoms of PTSD, such as intense psychological distress, depression, paranoia, disturbance, outbursts of anger, uh, sleep disturbance, excuse me. He has a greater uh, perceived threat of danger and an experience persistent negative emotional state. So we have this, as David's journaling through the Psalms, we see this overflow of pain and these symptoms of these traumas. For example, here in Psalm 6, he says, Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. I am worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of my foes. Some of you can relate to something like that. Maybe you've gone through a trauma and you've experienced some of these things that we've seen with Job and now here with, with David. But it's not just the Old Testament people. We see also New Testament Christ followers that had serious trauma that took place and then because of that these symptoms that are consistent with PTSD. Paul, for example, is one. Paul ex ex experienced significant trauma. And in one place, he just lists them down. Some of the highlights, some of the things that he says, hey, here's some of the things, the traumas I've had uh, in my life over the last few years. He says this to the Corinthians. He says, I have been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. So Paul writes about all of these traumas that had happened and, and near-death experiences and floating in the open sea, uh, just exposed to the elements, you know, for a day and a half. And, 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 then he, and then we see in his writings some of the symptoms that would be consistent with PTSD, such as fear, anxiety, a helpless feeling, feelings of estrangement from others, intense psychological distress, persistent negative emotional state, hypervigilance, sleep disturbance. And here's a couple examples. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 5, he says, for when we came into Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside. And now listen to this, fears within. So here it is, fears just churning inside him this emotional, spiritual overflow of pain from that trauma. And then we see him say, we are under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we de despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. So you have Job, you have David, you have Paul, these guys that experienced trauma, and then the symptoms of PTSD that seem to be consistent with that, with that, with that uh, illness. So they suffered with that. And, and there's a lot of people that suffer with that. It, there's, it's just part of life going through trauma and then experiencing uh, the pro processing that mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So what do you do when you're in that situation? Maybe you're, maybe you're, you have PTSD. Maybe you're not sure. And you just, all you know is you went through some kind of trauma and it, it's spilling into your, your life into your dreams, into your relationships. What do you do? Well, let me give you three things, okay? Number one is that you should uh, consider professional help. Consider professional help. The, what we're doing here in the Facing Mental Pain uh, Unmasked series is we're taking mostly a pastoral approach. We do have some clinicians that will come uh, speaking uh, the last two weeks. We had one the first week, clinical psychologist, they're, 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 they're going to be talking to us in more depth from that approach. But when I, what I've been sharing is, is mostly a pastoral approach. And so sometimes we need more uh, from, from than, than we're going to get at a pastoral approach. Let me give you an example. On this slide here, you'll see that uh, at the bottom of the slide is the physical first aid there on the bottom left. 
And if, so if you get hurt physically, that's what you're going to need. But depending on the severity of it, you might need something more, something either basic or, or advanced life support. You might even need surgery or you might need medicine of some sort. Well, just like that, as you can see on the top lines, it says psychological first aid. There's, and that's kind of the approach we're here. We're at this pastoral part, we're talking about psychological first aid, just uh, at, at, at a, at a uh, emergency kind of uh, a level. But there, then there's crisis intervention. There's uh, professional counseling. And then there's, you, you, sometimes people are helped through psychotherapy or drugs such as antidepressants or antipsychotics or the various kinds of medications that they that can often help that, that is recommended. So you might be in a situation where you need more than 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 what we're talking about today. But for many of you, this is a good starting place to be thinking about it, to say, hey, I'm going to start facing this. I'm not going to just run from it. I'm not going to pretend that it doesn't exist. Now, I'd like you to hear the story of a member of our church who has suffered from a PTSD because of traumas that happened in her, in her life. And she needed professional help, not just in therapy, but she needed professional help from uh, shelters and for, uh, for the police and from the courts because of the abuse was so significant. I'd like you to hear her story. Please listen to Donna Hurst. My name is Donna Hurst. And I was raised in a pretty normal home, a nuclear family. My dad was a pastor. When I was of college age, I uh, met a young man who was in the military and we got married. We started to have children and had a relatively decent life. He went um, into the law enforcement field and as a result of some stress that he was feeling between the children and his occupation, he began to use methamphetamines. And the result of his drug abuse was uh, abuse toward me. And it originally started as verbal, it degraded into physical. For three years, I spent running and hiding from him. And because of his occupation, he had access to a lot of information and he would always find me. And when he found me, he would um, physically, quote unquote, punish me for leaving him. There were points where he'd put a knife to my throat I know what it's like to have a gun put in my face and face death and not know when those types of incidents are going to occur. And I became very desperate and I really just wanted to die. After one particularly violent incident, I remember just looking up toward the sky and, and just asking God, please kill me because he's going to kill me and I don't want him to do that. And I as clear as day heard the Lord speak to me and tell me it will end he will be silenced it wasn't an immediate release but it was a couple of months some real miracles occurred my ex-husband was actually arrested and sent to prison for his crimes um, I was granted a lifetime restraining order against my ex-husband and I was given that opportunity to heal so PTSD manifested itself to me in a couple of different ways. Some of them were unique to what I experienced. I had nightmares where I felt I couldn't be helped, where law enforcement, I was calling for law enforcement and nobody was answering 911 and they weren't responding. I had um, situations where I would feel uncomfortable and rather shaky being in an enclosed room that I just didn't want to be in a spot where I couldn't escape. But the Lord helped me through that. He brought healing. Um, I was able to meet with a really good counselor who gave me some tips on how to deal with my feelings. One of the theme verses for my life is to comfort others as I have been comforted. And sometimes I've had to be pushed to do that. I was able to co-found a nonprofit organization uh, in Sacramento, California, and uh, work with stalking victims and domestic violence victims and law enforcement and inmates and prisons. One year, I was back in Washington, D.C., and I was asked to testify to Congress about the Violence Against Women Act and you know what had helped me through um, the processes that were put in place through the police departments. And when I was back there, it was October, and I kind of flashed back to, you know, that time where I looked up to God and asked Him to end it, and he, I heard His voice, you know, say it would end, my ex-husband would be silenced, 
and I was standing in front of the U.S. Capitol and I looked up and I saw the dome and I thought, wow, he ended it and my ex-husband was silenced and I got a voice and I thank God for that. Well, Proverbs says, get all of the advice you can and you will succeed. Without it, you will fail. And so we need to be people that get counsel, that get help from others, just like Donna did. We just, we, we, we're not in this alone. And so that's part of the reason we have the, the body of Christ to help us. But there's also professionals that, are, that can come alongside and help us as well. Another thing we can do is focus on something better. Proverbs 4.23 says, Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Now, the Bible says that we are involved in this spiritual battle. And the spiritual battle involves our mind. And so there is this place where we have to uh, choose to uh, direct our mind and think about things that we're, we want to think about. And so we direct it and we have to realize, okay, I'm not going to just focus on the negative. Uh, there's, a, there's this volitional part of me that chooses to say, I'm going to think about something else. Uh, Proverbs 4.23 says, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. And so what captures my attention, it captures me. So I have to, I have to if I'm going to gravitate towards a different place, I need to, I need to help, help my thoughts change in that place. I need to replace negative thoughts with positive thoughts. Philippians 4, 8 says, fill your mind with things that are good and deserve praise. Things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. This is the principle of replacement. Principle of replacement means you, you don't think of you don't just stop thinking negative thoughts. You have to think of positive thoughts. Because if you just stop one thing, it just fills back up. It's just like uh, uh, my gas tank. My gas tank is always full. Sometimes with gas, sometimes with air. Seems like more air lately than gas. But, but it's never empty. A vacuum is an unnatural state in this world. And so as the gas leaves, the air comes in. It always has something in it. And that's true of our minds. Our minds always are filled with something. And so the Bible says, make sure and fill your mind with positive things, things that are honorable and true and helpful and, uh, and worth being thought about. And those negative things, those fears, those anxieties, there is a, there's a conscious effort where we say, I'm not going to dwell on that stuff. I'm going I'm 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 to focus over here. And then number three is enlist a support group. We all need reinforcement. We need support. This is not a, a solo journey. Oh, it is something we do with other people, people that can help us. Ecclesiastes 4, their verses 9 and 10 says, two are better than one because together, if one of them fails, falls down, the other can help them up. But if someone is alone and falls, there is no one to help them up. And so what happens is if we're doing it alone, our best intentions often don't go anywhere. We, we, we decide to make some kind of change and, you know, two, three, four weeks down the road, we're still, we're back doing the same thing again. And so when we have somebody else to help us, which is what the purpose of the body of Christ does anyways, when we're in support groups, when we're in recovery groups and we have our healing ministries, we have a number of the, a number of the ministries and when we come alongside and we get involved, other people can encourage us, they can pray for us. I just want to close with this, this story about my experience with a support group and how they helped me in prayer and specifically over a pretty significant drama that, trauma that happened in my life. A number of years ago, my kids were much smaller. I have three boys. They were, they were young. My youngest was three years old. And we were down in Orlando at a, uh, at a hotel. The hotel was situated right next to like a canal, uh, kind of a, a river, but it was more like a canal that was very, very dirty and was used. Uh, some, some people moving barges were on it. And there was a pier there right next to the, to the, uh, where the hotel was to give access to the hotel. And then right off the pier on the hotel property was a pool. And our family was there swimming in the pool. Sharon had to go back to the, to the bedroom, so, to the hotel room. So she was back into the hotel room. And uh, I was left with the three kids. Well, my, <clears throat> my youngest child had done something, uh, I don't know, had disobeyed me or something. I had put him in timeout on one of the chase lounges right next to the pool. And as I was interacting with my other two kids, I look over and he's gone. So I call Sharon up. I say, Sharon, d is our son with you? And she goes, no, he's with you. So now I realize I have two problems. I have my missing son and now I'm responsible for that, 
Uh, but Sharon comes out. Of course, we start looking for him everywhere. We go all over the hotel grounds. We can't find him. 10, 15, 20 minutes go by. He's not anywhere to be seen. So then we remember that he was enamored by that canal. So we're thinking, oh no, he might have slipped over there, went in and then fell off the pier into the water. So I started looking for him. I started diving into the water. I couldn't see anything, so I would have to dive down. And it was a good 10, 12 feet down. And I would hold my breath and go down and, and, and flail my arms around trying to look for his body. I was thinking maybe I could resuscitate him if I could find him. And it was very, very uh, emotionally and physically draining, very, very grueling. I did that for like 15, 20 minutes. And uh, after that time, the hotel staff had been alerted and they had called the Orlando police and sent an alert out for our son. Scuba divers came in and uh, relieved me, started looking for his body. At that point, they knew if he had drowned, uh, he would not survive. They were just looking more thoroughly for his body. And over two hours went by and we could not find our son. We were praying, we were desperate. We were going, what in the world? What, how could this have happened? And all of the stress that comes from that. It just now, fortunately for us, our story turned out very good. Our son was found. What he had done was is he had left the pool without telling me and gone to a different room. I guess he probably thought it was our room. And somebody had put the latch in the door and he opened it up and they, were, they had gone and he jumped on the bed and fell asleep and took a nice nap, just relaxing. He had a nice two and a half, two, two hour and 15 minute nap. And then we were, when he was found, of course, we went through the normal parental stuff of being angry at him and then hugging him and crying. But what I experienced after that, I didn't, I had never experienced before. The kind of, from that trauma that affected me so deeply that from, for the next time we went on a family vacation, I couldn't enjoy it. I was completely stressed out, filled with anxiety. My, it was every night I would have these terrible nightmares. In fact, it would happen before we even went. Two, three, four weeks before, I would start having these terrible night sweats, nightmares that one of my kids had, had been injured or lost or killed. And, and it just, I, I would, and then the second year came around, I thought, I can't go on this way. And so I enlisted some of the people in my small group. Hey, would you pray with me? This is what I'm going through. And they came alongside. They heard my story. They prayed with me. They encouraged me. And it got a little better. And then the next year, it got a lot better, but it was still there. Then the, finally, the following year, I was able to go and enjoy a vacation with my family without uh, being tormented in my sleep and in my thoughts about what might happen. That's the purpose of the body of Christ. We come alongside. We encourage one another. We help each other in, 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 as, as, we're, as we're going through life's challenges. James 5, 16 says, make this your common practice. Now listen to this. Confess your sins to one another, not to a priest, but to one another, and pray for each other so that you may live together whole and healed. I love that. We come together, we share our weaknesses, share the problems we're having, we pray for one another, and then in that midst of that environment, he says, you'll be whole and you'll be healed. That, God offers healing. And uh, it's something that we need to take him up on. Now, what I want to do is close with a prayer. Okay, this is a confessional prayer. So I'd like you to pray along with me, it, preferably to pray it out loud. There's something powerful when we pray out loud. And so I'm going to invite you to do that. If you're from a confessional church, you're saying, hey, no problem. I love doing this. Uh, but if this is new to you, why don't you try it? And uh, you can just say, okay, I'm going to pray along with you. And, uh, and here it is. It is kind of long. But just go with me on this. Now, if, if you don't have PTSD, this prayer won't hurt you. It's not like you're going to pray this and say, oh, I've come down with PTSD. Uh, it, but what will happen is if you have stress, if you have anxiety, if you have some trauma, if you have any residue, it'll, it helps to clear the palate. It helps to clear your soul out. And if you're suffering from this, this is God's medicine. This is the part where he comes along, that spiritual part, which affects us physically and emotionally. So let's do that right now. Okay, ready? Let's repeat after me as we pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you as a witness to declare, to declare my freedom from the spirit of death and its influences by the power and authority granted to me 
by the Lord Jesus Christ. I renounce the spirit of death and all unclean spirits associated with it. I renounce any and all mental, emotional, and spiritual attachments with death or harm for myself or others. I renounce all identification, activity, and preoccupation with suicidal thoughts, self-hatred, death fantasies, illness or despair, hopelessness or depression, isolation or abandonment. I renounce bitterness, rage, anxiety, fear, rejection, and I renounce any medical pronouncement of incurability. You say, Lord, I make a conscious effort to forgive those who knowingly or unknowingly have hurt me. Today, I come to you as a child, as your child. I put myself under your protective care. Help me to let go of my past. I choose to believe the truth that you have not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Therefore, I renounce any spirit of fear. I ask that you reveal to my mind fears that are controlling me. I praise you and thank you for upholding and covering me in your everlasting love. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen.